the perfect beef wellington done my way with a few little twists and turns here and there but ah oh, look at that beef and then for dessert we're doing trifle but not just any trifle this one is beautifully spiced and you better believe that it's boozy my friends it's christmas time let's make some delicious christmas things I mean, who needs presents when you've got a Wellington? <laughs> Look at me! Yes. Look what I made! <laughs> All right, guys, so for this Christmas episode, I wanted to take, you know, some awesome classics, but do them better. <laughs> can you do a Wellington better? I think I can do it better. And also add some extra, like, fun in there. I think Wellington needs some fun. So with our Wellington, we're gonna walk through quite a bit of technique, but I'm gonna make it easier for you guys um, by showing you all the little tricks to getting the perfect layers and the perfectly cooked beef inside. And with the trifle, we're just gonna go all out delicious. I mean, there's chocolate cake, there's rum, there's some beautiful Asian aromatics in there. It is a good time, I promise you. But let's get onto our Wellington first of all, because this requires a little bit of construction. Let's do it together. First of all, I'm gonna start off with the beef. And you don't see this step in very many recipes for beef wellington and i know there are a lot but i think it really helps out uh, we're going to start by shaping the beef first of all now you want to ask your butcher for the center cut piece of eye fillet and that means you just get a really nice even piece pop that onto some cling film wrap that up and really wrap that nice and tight so that we're shaping the beef up into a cylinder from the very beginning all right now just pop that into the fridge while you're doing all your other bits and pieces for your Wellington. So the next part of our Wellington is the much, much mushroom. Uh, I haven't even got to the, the French word yet, which I can't pronounce either. <laughs> the next part of our Wellington is the mushroom duxelle. Duxelle, duxelle, duxelle. I'm not sure it's spelt duxelle, but I'm sure the French pronounce it much nicer. Dax? No, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not Dexcel though. <laughs> we could just Google it, you know. <laughs> Duxel. Okay, so for the next part of our Wellington, we want to do our mushroom layer. Um, so this mixture starts off with some button mushrooms. You could use Swiss browns as well. Now the secret to my mushroom layer is actually dried shiitake mushrooms. So I've had these guys soaking in some hot water, so they're nice and soft. And the reason why these are really great is that you can go ahead and use uh, dried porcini mushrooms, but they are ridiculously expensive. So you're kind of cutting a little corner here and then you can spend a little bit more on your beef. So I think that's a win in my book. Now I just cut the stems off of these shiitakes because the stems just stay really firm and tough. Nothing you can do about that. Now I also need some shallots here, some garlic, and this just gets blended up. So with these, I want them really finely chopped rather than like too pasty. Just a little bit of a mix. Okay, so this kind of like finely chopped situation is what you're after here. Okay, so now what we wanna do is fry this mixture off. Now, I'm gonna start with a little bit of oil and then just a little bit of butter as well. Now, pop all of that in there. And the idea here is that we want to cook off the mushrooms, make sure that we're cooking off the shallots and the garlic so we don't have any of that raw garlic shallot flavor. But also, I want to make sure that this mixture is as dry as possible. Where you can go wrong with the Wellington is when the mushroom mixture is too wet. That's going to make everything soggy. Okay, so that's looking good. I want to add some salt here as well. Now, I need you to be a bit patient here. So just let that kind of sizzle away. Come back and stir it every so often until we've got a really lovely dry mixture and you can see it's just starting to turn kind of like golden. In the meantime, we've got some crepe batter to make. Now the crepe layer is an important one because it protects your pastry from getting soggy with any meat or mushroom juices. Um, but the key is you wanna get a really lovely thin crepe batter because you don't want a big chunky pancake in your Wellington. So we start off with some flour. 
Now we need some milk, eggs, and a little melted butter. Now just mix up those wet ingredients first and then combine them with the flour. Now I always think with crepe batter that you want to go a little bit thinner than you think because what happens is I'm going to let the crepe batter rest for a little bit and it's going to thicken up a little bit before we go to cook it um, and that's just going to give you the perfect texture. So this is sort of the texture of a thin pouring cream or a half and half cream and then to that I'm going to add in some spring onion, a little pinch of salt, kind of getting like Chinese spring onion or scallion pancake vibes here which is nice. So that is our crepe mixture done. We'll come back to that later. Now my mushrooms are looking really good here. I've just got that little bit of color. And now see how dry that pan is. There's not much liquid going on there at all. And that's exactly what we want. Now what I want to do here is deglaze the pans. So that kind of like lifts off all that lovely caramelization in the pan. I'm going to do that with some Shaoxing wine. So splash here. Now let that cook away again until all of the liquid has evaporated. Now you might be wondering like, why would I put the wine in and wait for it to disappear and evaporate? Well, the liquid evaporates, but the flavor and the fragrance of the Shaoxing wine stays with the mushrooms. So that's what we're after. So this mushroom mixture is looking perfect. I'm gonna pop it out here. Now I want to let this mushroom mixture cool down before I add the rest of my little bits and pieces here. So let's cook some crepes. Now my crepe batter here looks perfect. It's probably thickened up ever so slightly, um, but still that lovely pouring cream consistency. Okay, so I've got a, um, a hot pan here. I'm just going to brush with a little bit of butter. Now the trick to getting a super thin, elegant, lovely crepe is all about how you handle the pan. So you want to grab a nice little ladleful of your batter and then add, pour and swirl at the same time. You'll see how it goes. So just kind of add it in, swirl and keep swirling and you just want to coat the bottom of that pan. Now the reason I keep going on about having really thin crepes is that if your crepe is too thick, if it looks like a pancake, um, when you go to wrap your Wellington, the crepe will crack and break. So that's the whole idea behind having a nice thin crepe. Now this should be so thin that it should cook really quickly. And if you have a look here, I haven't even flipped it and the top of this crepe is actually cooked through. So that's how you really know if you've done a good job of getting a nice thin crepe. Just checking underneath here. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I don't want it too darkly colored and it should kind of just like flop out. There we go. Now, I like to get some baking paper on top. I don't want my crepes sticking. And then we're just gonna make some more crepes. I think you need about five to be safe. Are you a thick or thin pancake kind of guy, Dax? Thin. Thin, really? Do you do like sugar and lemon juice or honey or any of those kind of Australian things? Yeah, yeah ah. use the uh, the lemon. Yeah, yeah. Do you? Yeah. Ah, Haley, are you thick or thin? Thin. Thin. Yeah, but I'm a crepe girl. I'm not really a pancake. Oh, you're a crepe girl. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I love if I'm going to do a thin pancake. I love to do sugar or honey and the lemon and the roll up. You know. Yeah. But if I'm gonna do like the thick fluffy pancakes and I want like bacon and maple syrup and... I still don't understand the whole oh, maple syrup. Oh, well, Dax, come on. Like with bacon though? Yes, it's delicious. It's like salty and sweet and fluffy and crispy and... Oh my God, you've got to do <laughs> bacon and banana. I've not done it, but I'll give it... Bacon and banana? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you have to. <laughs> I don't know about the bacon and banana. Yeah, it's Canadian, but it's so Is good. it? Yeah. Well, I'm happy to get, I mean, I love bacon, bacon and pancakes, so I'm sure I would love bacon and banana and pancakes. My mushroom mixture is nice and cool now, so I'm going to do the aromatics. I've got some spring onion and some lemon zest. 
Now surprisingly, this lemon zest works really well with another little Asian uh, ingredient I'm gonna add a bit later on. You'll see what I mean in just a second. Now I'm also gonna add in here some miso paste. So totally not a classic ingredient, but this is like all about umami and saltiness and really kind of boosting that mushroom flavor. So I want that and then I want some Dijon mustard as well. I'll just give that a mix. So now we're getting to the beefy part and instead of seasoning my beef with um, straight out peppercorns, I'm gonna do Szechuan peppercorns. Uh, so these guys are going to add a really beautiful, lovely citrus flavor, as well as your kind of pepperiness, and is so much better than just a regular old peppercorn. Asian ingredients. We make everything better. <laughs> now I just want a nice, uh, sort of like a coarse grind on this. It have to be really fine. And now for the beef itself, just unwrap that. And you can see this is a really nice shape now. So we're starting out uh, with a good shape and I want lots of salt on there. Now when your pan's really hot, just add a little bit of oil. And now contrary to like, I don't know, about a million Wellington videos, uh, this step is not about like sealing in juices because you can't possibly seal in juices. It's like a complete furphy. Um, <laughs> what we're actually doing here is we're getting flavor. So that beautiful caramelization on the outside of that beef with the salt crust, um, that's giving us flavor. We're not locking in juice. Yeah, don't you? I get really annoyed when I hear people go, oh, it's gonna lock in the juices. <laughs> Lock in the juices. It's not going to lock in the juices. It's going to lock in the juices. It's man. not going to lock in the juices. <laughs> Flavour. That's what we're after. Now we get the sizzle. And you want to give it like, I don't know, about 30, 40 seconds each side or maybe a minute each side just until you get a really beautiful colour. Now see all that lovely caramelization. That's what we're after. That looks really good. Now don't forget to do the ends as well. Okay, so this is looking really good. Now I just wanna take that beef off the heat and let it rest until it comes to room temperature. Now before I go any further, this is a really tiny but crucial step. And I think one of the things that um, is missing in a lot of Wellington recipes. So, you know you've seen that Wellington situation where like the, the base of the pastry is all wet and soggy. I think that, that you can help prevent that by putting your oven tray that you're gonna bake your Wellington in into the oven, preheating it so that when the Wellington goes on top, it's straight away starting to cook that pastry on the bottom. So put your tray into the oven well before you go to bake your Wellington. So now our beef's ready to go, I can give it a very luxurious brushing with some mustard. You want a Dijon here, some hot English is really gonna like give some people a heart attack at the table. <laughs> Can you imagine? That would be funny, but don't do that. Just do the Dijon. Be nice. And a lovely sprinkle of our Szechuan peppercorns. Mm, I love that smell. Now we're at the construction phase. I feel like there's a lot of phases that come with a Wellington, but it is what it is. Uh, and it is quite good, because you could do all of this the day before, by the way, um, and then get it into the oven the day after, if you would like to. So crepes first. Now I'm gonna lay four down on here. And the reason I got you to do five is that if you get a tear in one of your crepes, you can use that last one to kind of patch things up. So it's like a backup crepe, if you like. Now, my mushroom mixture, I'm gonna get that on here and then spread it out into a really neat rectangle. Now, I like to be pretty pedantically neat about <laughs> about everything that happens here on in. Um, try to be as precise as you can so that you get really even layers when you go and cut into your Wellington. So, nice edges. 
beef goes on top. And now roll the crepe and the mushroom sort of over the top of that beef. You really kind of want to tuck that crepe underneath there. Okay, so we're looking pretty good here, but I've got way too much crepe happening on the side of my beef here. So just use some scissors to cut off that excess. And then just kind of tuck the sides as kind of neatly as you can here and roll everything up in that cling film. And then just keep rolling up the sides. until you get a really nice, tight cylinder log shape. Now that needs to go into the freezer to kind of set things for about 15 minutes. So for the pastry, you wanna make sure you've got a sheet that will obviously fit your Wellington when you go to roll it over. Now I'm gonna thin this out a little bit um, because I'm gonna do another lattice layer on top. So just a little bit of flour on here. And Roll that, and you're looking for about a three mil thickness here. So that looks about right to me. I'm just gonna grab my beef. Now this is really nice and firm after being in the freezer. So just snip off the sides, unwrap that log carefully. Now transfer that over onto your pastry and roll that over. I don't want any excess pastry here, so I'm gonna cut this just here and over. Now give this a nice even brush with some egg yolk. And then now we're gonna do some lattice work with another piece of puff pastry here. So I'm gonna use uh, this lattice roller, which makes things very easy to just roll through my pastry here, cut off these extra strips here. And now here's something that I also noticed was missing from a lot of Wellington recipes and videos that use this lattice roller. So the lattice roller just doesn't seem to cut through um, the lattice all the way. If you try to put that on, it just doesn't work. So what you need to do is just do a little bit of extra work here. Put some flour on your piece of pastry and get a really fine or small knife and first of all, try and separate out the lattice as best as you can. And anywhere you kind of see where it hasn't quite cut through, use your knife to separate and pull that out a little bit. And just keep going really gently along that whole piece of pastry. Okay, so our lattice has now taken shape. Uh, what we need to do is transfer it onto our Wellington. So I like to do this by just grabbing a rolling pin just flip that onto the top, roll a little, and then just kind of transfer <laughs> as best you can. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit, that's like the danger mouse part of the recipe. Okay, just kind of fix this up a little, cut off any edges here, and then just gently tuck the bottoms under. Oh, that's starting to look really pretty. I mean, this, this is the point where you should be like smiling, going, yay, I'm really making Wellington, this is so fun. That's what I do, but I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyone else gets that excited about Wellington. Don't you think like you get to this point, Hayley, and you're like, yes, yes. look at me. Yes. Look what I made. <laughs> now we also need a bit more egg here as well. Now before we bake, I like to get this into the fridge for 15 minutes just to make sure that pastry really firms up. All right, so remember that tray that we put into the oven a little while ago? Let's just get that one out and then transfer your Wellington onto your hot tray. All right, so if you've followed all the exact steps, you've put it in the fridge for the same amount of time as me, um, this is your guide to cooking times. Now I had a 625 gram piece of eye fillet uh, in my Wellington, and this is gonna cook for 35 minutes exactly, and it will come out beautifully medium rare. I mean, if you're one of those well done people, well, you shouldn't be making Wellington or cooking I feel it. <laughs> don't talk to me if you don't like, if you like well done meat. <laughs> Was that too rude for Christmas? <laughs> Thank you.
Now I've had a peek at this thing. It looks glorious. Let's get in here, huh? Ah, oh, this is so good. And there you go, my friends. I mean, look at that pastry. That is so perfect. I love, I just love everything about that. <laughs> now, a really easy way to test if your beef is cooked perfectly through the center is to take a very thin metal skewer or a cake tester, pop that in through the center here, and then pull it out and just test it on the top of your lip. And if it's like, just warm like just above room temperature you know just slightly warm that is like a medium rare if it's cold that means it's rare and i'd pop it back in the oven for another five minutes but what you do need to do um, once your beef is perfectly cooked is leave this to rest for 20 minutes the temperature of the beef inside will keep rising and will kind of cook it through beautifully but you do need the 20 minutes don't skimp on the 20 minutes so now we're at the moment of truth. <laughs> it's kind of, I'm kind of nervous, it's scary, but it's still very fun. All right, let's get in here. Ah, wow, I mean, look at that. That is so perfect. I mean, that, the beautiful layers, everything is just lovely and neat and amazing. And that beef is so perfectly cooked. I mean, that is, the perfect medium rare. Oh, I'm so happy with that. And do you know actually what's really great about cooking eye fillet in a Wellington is that it does actually make a lot of sense because the beef is cooked so gently that beef should just literally like cut like butter. Oh, wow. I mean, that just oh, makes me so excited. Okay, so I typically like to serve this out on a platter. You could do some more carving at the table and like impress everyone. <laughs> Got some green beans here. And I just like a little sauce on the side. This is just some hoisin that I've mixed with a little bit of water to thin it out so it's a nice kind of pouring consistency. And there you go, friends. I mean, when you cook something as impressive and beautiful as a Wellington, you want to have a whole bunch of people over to say, wow, look what you did. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to cook a Wellington for yourself. Well, you might cook a Wellington for yourself, but this is like celebration food to me. This is the food kind of food that I want to share. Um, and people know that you've gone to a lot of effort. But the thing here is, I'm going to eat a whole lot of Wellington. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> oh my goodness, a little bit of sauce here. Ah, oh, that looks so good. I mean, you have to wait so long for a Wellington. It's like, ah. Oh. When can I eat the Wellington? Oh. Mm -hmm. It's just like I said, that beef is so tender. But the really special thing with this one is you can taste that Szechuan peppercorn and the lemon zest in the mushroom actually gives um, that Szechuan flavor a really good like, pop. It's so interesting. It's so much more interesting than a classic Wellington, I think, but then I think adding Asian things to anything makes it better. So this is my thing, but I think it's beautiful. Ah, oh, wow. Very good. Okay, so Wellington's spectacular, but don't go away because we have a show-stopping dessert coming right up. So to start the trifle off, we need to make a jelly and I'm gonna use good old fashioned jelly crystals. Uh, this is a port wine flavor and just pop that into my little Jug here, need some boiling water. Okay, so just give that a little mix. And now this is a boozy trifle. It's an adult's trifle. Um, so I'm gonna go in here with some spiced rum. Some whiskey would be nice here as well. Some brandy. Okay, so just let that cool down a little. Now take a trifle bowl and I want to put some cherries into the layer first of all. And I've got some pitted cherries here. So just sort of pile those in the bottom, a nice layer. You could do other fruits here, like raspberries would be really lovely. Uh, even, let's see, you could do frozen or canned cherries as well if you couldn't get fresh. Now my jelly goes on top. And then this needs to go into the fridge for four hours or overnight. So now onto another layer and we're gonna make a cherry compote. So I'm gonna start with some sugar first of all. And some water. 
This is a very simple trifle, by the way. Some store-bought ingredients are gonna help us out a little bit later on. Um, but what we do wanna do here is add some really beautiful spiced flavors because even though we're cheating a little bit, we still wanna make things nice. So to that, I also wanna add, again, some rum. I'm using the spiced rum, and that like automatically gives you some flavor. And now some star anise, cinnamon sticks, And then this just needs to simmer for about 10 minutes or until it's thickened just ever so slightly. All right, so this is looking pretty good. Now I'm gonna add in um, the rest of my cherries here. So the rest of my pitted cherries go in. And then you turn the heat off and just let that sit um, until it cools down to room temperature and by then those cherries kind of soak up all the spiced flavor and they kind of get a little like boozy themselves. So ooh, it's, it's a good time, trust me. All right, so in the meantime, let's get on to doing our cream layer. Now there are a couple of little secret ingredients here in my cream layer. First of all, I'm gonna start off with mascarpone. So this is a really rich, slightly sour cream and extra richness of the mascarpone, I think, kind of gives you a little bit of that custard kind of vibe, which you do have in some trifles. It's very rich and luscious anyway, it's delicious. Okay, now I want some cream here as well. So this is just regular pouring cream and some icing sugar and some vanilla extract. Now this is where I want you to be really careful because I don't want this mixture to overbeat and turn into butter, essentially. <laughs> so just mix for like 30 seconds to a minute, not very long at all. So that's it. And now something you might not think to add into a sweet cream uh, is sour cream, which I'm gonna be adding in here. And this just kind of cuts through the sweetness and the richness of the entire trifle, I think adding that little edge of um, tartness and tanginess. Now just make sure that's well mixed through. All right, now chocolate cake. So because we're going for that black forest kind of vibe, the cherry chocolate, um, that's why we want to go with the chocolate cake. You know what? I don't need to be a hero the whole of Christmas. And so I'm going to use a store-bought mud cake completely okay in this situation, more than okay. No one will know. I just want you to break this up into nice rough chunks. And just like that, we are ready to assemble our trifle. So I've got all my bits and pieces here, my lovely cream, my cake, my cherry compote, and here is some jelly that I set yesterday. Okay, so what we wanna do here is start layering up. So I want cream on top of my jelly layer here, about half the cream to go in first. Now, I think the secret to a really beautiful trifle is to maintain some really lovely, sharp kind of layers. I want that beautiful jelly. I don't want my cream bleeding into the jelly or into the chocolate cake. So just push everything very nicely to the edges. Mm, already looks very cheerful. Okay, and now here's where we go in with our chocolate cake. All right, so that's looking um, very lush already. Now what I wanna do is add some of our cherry compote. I, cherry com, compote, compote. You know, there's a lot of words in this video <laughs> that I am probably mispronouncing with my amazing Australian accent. I grew up in a half Thai, half Australian family. We don't say French words, okay. <laughs> Cherry compote. Dollop my cherries on top. Make sure you spoon in a lovely amount of that beautiful syrup that you've made. And I kind of like to place some of these cherries in here just to make sure on the sides of the dish that you can see all the separate layers. Cherries on top of that chocolate cake. And now because this is not your virtuous kind of trifle, uh, we're gonna add in some more rum. <laughs> Why not? I mean, for me, a trifle is always lovely and boozy. It's kind of like, um, yeah, a mix between dessert and, you know, a, a beautiful drink at the end of, of your dinner or your lunch. Now we add our final layer of cream. And now here, I just kind of want to swirl that cream around. 
This is going to be our final layer. Some more of our cherry compote on top. And some extra fresh cherries just to pile on the top here. Okay guys, and that is a wonderful, wonderful masterpiece. I mean, look at those layers. That is so fun. I love this kind of Christmas cooking. It's the kind of thing that you just don't do any other time of year. Um, and I love that. So what we need to do is get like right in there, like the whole, I need a, uh, you know, a scoop of every single layer. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna get in there. Oh yeah, look at that. Cherry, chocolate, cream, jelly. <sighs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think trifles were like one of those things that was like, it's like before Instagram, you know. I mean, I think that looks delicious. But it's like kind of like a, a delicious mess, you know what I mean? Well, cherry on top, there we go. Ta da! <laughs> this is gonna be a joy, an absolute joy. That is so. So good. I mean, mm, the chocolate, the cherry, it's literally like, it's just like boozy black forest cake. <laughs> it's really good. Mm. Yum. So there we go, guys. I mean, that's pretty much like an ultimate Christmas main and dessert for me. You have that amazing Wellington, which is I mean, such an impressive thing to do for friends and not that hard when you break it down. And then you've got the trifle to beat all trifles. I mean, this thing is glorious. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it. So on that point, I'm just gonna continue eating some trifle here. Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope your Christmas is delicious, safe, happy, but more than anything, delicious. Mm. Yum, yum, yum. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that Christmas special. If you did, why not subscribe to my channel and hit that little bell button so you always know when I'm cooking something delicious. See you.